All right, so now let's talk about MIPS functions and see if we can use some of the things that we've learned about branching and jumping in particular um, to implement functions. Um, so ultimately, functions are in MIPS or in its in assembly are essentially jumping to a label. Um, but of course, like every function that needs to return, um, we have to find a way to get back um, to the place that we wish to return to just, uh, just prior to the jump was called. So with MIPS, um, we'll talk about functions and uh, sometimes functions are called methods or procedures or subroutines depending on which language you're looking at. But there are these conventions that we're interested in. Um, and these conventions, um, many of them are going to be specific to, um, to MIPS. Um, and, and some of them are going to carry over into other, you know, the majority of what we're going to talk about is going to carry over into other assembly languages. But there are some, some conventions that, that we've assumed that we're using because it makes um, working with assembly easier. So um, let's take a simple example. I have a function called sum. And in this function called sum, I want to be able to add values a and b together. Um, you can follow along with this link over here at CodePad to see um, how, to, how to work with this directly, uh, to get some hands-on experience in working with this directly. But if you look at this, you'll see that um, this, is, um, this pound sign is essentially just a comment. We do an add immediate, which adds a 4 and a 0 together, giving us just the 4 and we move it into a register and then we do an add immediate with a 3 and a 0 and pull that into a register and then we call a function um, called sum and the way we're going to call a function is by jumping to a particular label so what does that look like right when we're finally ready to actually call this function by running this line of code that jumps to a sum um, or jumps to the sum label, we can take a look at that by going into Mars um, and observing what happens. So let's go ahead and uh, let's save this. Um, Save this and let's run this. And so, what you can see here is let's magnify this. Magnify, do the magnifier. Make this a little bit bigger. So, what you can see here is that the add immediate should put a 4 into a0, should put a 1 into a1, and then it should jump to this label called sum, where it calculates a0 plus a1. Um, and in the original code, when you jump to sum, um, it will jump to this label, where it takes what was passed in um, and stores it into a value v0, and then it jumps to up. And if we scroll back up, you'll see that up is the line um, just after we do the addition. Um, or just after, rather, um, we do the sum. So up should be, let's make this correction, up where we want it to go is the line immediately after we <clears throat> jump to sum. So that's a common pattern. Uh, once we jump to some place, where we want to return is not back to the original line, but to the next line, right? Otherwise, we would just jump back to sum, 
we, I mean, we would jump back to line 11, which would go to sum, and then if we had our label up here, um, then we would just kind of keep coming back up to the same spot. So we always want to return to the position that's right after the jump was done. So right after the kind of the point of departure, right after the code that, that calls a jump. Um, and so there's a pattern here that's worth paying attention to. Notice that A0 and A1 were added here, and then the result was placed in V0. So the convention um, with MIPS, at least the simple convention, convention when it comes to implementing functions, is to pass arguments or parameters of a function through particular registers, A0, A1, um, and then when we want to return a value, um, the convention is to return it through your V registers. Um, so A0, A1, um, A2, A3, if you have arguments you want to pass, you want to set them into those registers, and when you're ready to return a value, put it into V0, V1, and it's assumed by convention that the values returned are going to be inside of V0, and so you would um, typically need to save the value that's returned um, so that you may possibly use A0 and A1 for um, other purposes oh, and possibly V0. So, um, um, so more importantly, we want to make sure that we save the returned value by placing it into some particular location. It could be in the register, we could place it in memory, um, and then we can continue on with the rest of our code. So that is as simple an implementation of a function as, as what you'll probably see with assembly language. Um, it's just a matter of using a jump to a location and then jump back. Now, we do need to make a small modification um, because we may need to call that jump from another line of code, right? Just like with C, when you have a printf, you're not always calling a printf from the same position. So you somehow need to be able to return from wherever that function was called. Um, and so it's going to link us back. It's going to uh, link us back to that that point just after the function is called is going to be this JAL, so-called jump and link. Um, so it's not just a jump, but it's a jump, and then it does one other thing. It links, and when I say it links, it's going to place into register RA um, the subsequent address of where the jump was called. Um, so that allows us to, uh, to call or to jump from any location. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. And like I said, passing arguments to a called function. Um, we're going to put those into A0 through A3. We have four different uh, registers. And if we take a brief look at our green sheet, what you'll see on our green sheet or green card um, is that each register of our 32 registers, right? We're looking at registers 0 through 31 over here. But of our registers, um, each one also has a name, right? Um, in A0 through A3, it shows you that the use of those, A0 through A3, those four um, are commonly used for arguments or for passing in parameters. Um, and that use, there's no law that says you have to use those to pass in parameters exclusively, but that's the convention and it helps make your code um, easier to understand. You can start to see patterns in someone else's code um, if they are sticking to the conventions that we commonly use um, with, with MIPS in this case. Um, the other thing this talks about is registers returning values. So V0 through V1, and if you look over here, you'll see that um, 
that the convention, the claw convention, is that V0 and V1, are, which are also identified as registers 2 and 3, are values, um, are used for values that would be returned for function results. Um, and then remember when we looked at our function here, call it sum, we had to jump back up. So we just use, um, oops, down here, here's our sum rather. We had to jump back up. So there were two jumps um, that were used. There's a jump to the sum, and then in sum we had to jump to a particular label called up. Um, we're going to modify that a bit so that we're using not just a regular old jump, we're going to use a J R. So we're going to jump, jump to a value where we linked that value. We're going to jump to a value inside of a register. So J R um, will use the value or the register that comes just after that instruction um, to, to return. So jumping alone, as we've seen, is not sufficient. Um, so let's talk briefly um, about why, what types of problems would come up. If you look at this bit of um, C code here, um, the first line just, it's a, it calls a function. ASCII to integer, A-T-O-I, and it takes a value that comes in from the command line. Um, it comes in as a string, and so everything that's passed in from the command line is received as an array of characters. And so R V sub 1 is going to be um, that, that uh, string that gets typed in from the command line. In this case, we're assuming that it's an integer n that we wish to convert that to. Um, so what this means is that you have some type of program, and let's call the program foo, and then our Fibonacci, also fit, and you give it a value such as 9. Um, so your command line doesn't know if it's if you're giving it a name, if you're giving it uh, right, a file name. Um, all it knows is that it has a string of characters, an array of characters, and so we're going to have to do something with that string or that array of characters. And so RV1 will take that array of characters and interpret them in a way or convert them so that it's an integer. Once it gets that integer, it calls this function called factorial here. Um, and factorial um, if you can imagine now that we're going to jump to that line of code and then when we come back we want to print. And then what this C fragment does is that it looks to decrement in. Remember we just put in a 9 and we'd want to decrement it and run factorial again with an 8. We don't want to return um, to the same spot. We want to return, we want to return to the line that comes just after factorial was called. So let's look at how we would convert this to MIPS. We're going to name our function and we name our functions by putting in a label. It's a space and it's an area in memory. Um, when we look at this code that we just had here where we did a jump to sum. When I assemble this, notice that sum, uh, let's put this in hexadecimal addresses, the sum has a particular address, right? 0040014. Um, so sum has a particular address, it's a place in memory. It's where we do the addition, the add, VZ, add A0, A1. Um, so we were able to see that in, in the assembler itself. So um, your functions are labels, essentially. It's a combination of labels and jumps. 
So we start off with the main function defined by a label. Um, and then we just see this kind of a dot 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 ellipsis. We skip some of this other code um, that um, that was done here with integer in and um, ASCII to integer and so forth. And we get, and even we even skip this. So what this really shows is that we just go straight to the printf. We go off to printf. He prints the value, the Fibonacci value. He comes back, right? And then we decrement in call fact. Well, did I say Fibonacci? Let's call it factorial. It's actually factorial. So we go ahead and call factorial again. Um, and then we want to print f. And then we want to jump to the label that's just right after the jump. Um, in printf, when we do our jump to printf, he's going to initially jump back to what's right after that first printf. So what's really needed is not a jump after one. Like we don't want to jump to that label, that one single label. But rather, we always want to jump to the instruction that's right after the function call. And that's what a JAL is going to do for us. Um, your jump and link instruction is going to um, make it easier um, for us to jump to a sum, uh, jump to a label, um, do whatever it is we're going to do, store the value inside of v0 as is common, right? We're going to pass in a 0 and a 1, do the addition, and then we turn the value through v0. And return just simply means we're going to put a value into v0. When we do a jr, um, we're not jumping to a label, we're jumping to a value that's inside of a register. This register is ra, that stands for return address. So we're going to jump to a value that's inside of a register and that register is called return address. Well where did return address even get his value? Jump and link will put this next subsequent address into RA so that when we jump to sum and he does this thing on his last line of code when we do our return jump to or jump to register value uh, whatever's inside of RA we're going to go to not line 23 but we're going to go to line 24 the line just right after the jump and so that would complete our function call in order to not continue downward and call add again or at least do the addition again and call sum repeatedly what we're going to do is um, find a way to jump around or get out of uh, this is going to be the easiest way, easiest, easiest way of explaining it now we can come back and look at other ways of bailing out and doing a return from our function but jump to exit where an exit might be a label um, that's outside of our code or at the bottom of our code. There's a better way to do it, but this is this, this is a pretty simple, clear way of doing it for right now. So what I'd like to do is put this bit of code into our IDE Mars. Um, and let's run it briefly and, and, and take a look at how this um, works in practice. So let's see if we can um, get out of this presentation mode and let's go in and um, open that hyperlink so that we can get uh, some code from Pastebin. Um, and so what you'll see from that link is um, a bit of code that does the jump and link. So what I'll do is I'll go down to this next um, area here, do a control A to, to select all, control A, control C to copy it, and then um, 
I'll go in and paste it inside of uh, my IDE. So now, once again, I have my jump and link to sum, or my jump to sum, but now it's a jump and link. Um, and then inside of sum, this function, it'll do the addition, and then go back up to a value that's inside of RA. So let's assemble this. Um, let's also magnify it a little bit. Uh, let's see if we can look at the registers. Okay, so here we have it. We're going to put a value into A0 and a value into A1. So let's single step one, two. So inside of A0 and A1 should be a four and a three respectively. Let's go look over here. A0 and A1, I see a four and a three. So that worked. Then I want to jump and link to sum. Um, so that uh, value or that address sum is a label that's sitting over here where he's going to do that addition. And so sum we know contains or is at this address where it's a, a one four for the last two did last two um, hex digits. So we're trying to jump and link. And then when we're done, we want to return to this four zero 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 C, right? And this is a no op instruction. It's a 32 bit zero is essentially what it is just to take up space. But I know that after I jump here, when I return, I want to come back to the no op. Um, so when I do my jump and link right now, I'm expecting, if I go and look at my registers, I'm expecting um, this value here, RA, to get populated with the return address. So let's do one single step where we jump. And notice that when I did this jump, I went over to the addition. And this addition is the addition of my sum function. So let's go back and look at RA. So RA should have should really be a bookmark for where we want to go when we return. And there it is. There's our 40000C. So RA is populated. So now when I go back to my simple simple function and I add 0 A0 and A1, place it into V0 when I'm done, now I can do a JR, jump to the value that's inside of this register. Um, and so what should be in that value inside of the RA, what we saw to be inside of RA, is this one right here, 40000C. Um, and inside of V0 should be the sum of 4 and 3. We've already executed that line of code. So inside of V0 is our 7. So that works. So let's step. And it takes us right back to the instruction after we performed our jump and link. Um, and then the next instruction um, was essentially a jump to exit. If we go back and look at this um, after we did our add, which is our function, um, getting our argument set up for our function call. And then we did a jump and link to the sum, our blank instruction. We want to do a jump to the exit so that we don't just kind of continue on downward. So our exit in this case is just a label that's um, at the end of the code. And so we do that and we finish our jump and link in our JR um, pairing. So let's zoom back out and go back in. And so that's how our, our jump and link JR um, pairing uh, work together. Two-part operation. Um, I've heard some say it should be called a link and jump. 
because we do the link before we jump. Um, uh, but that's essentially what goes on with JAL. Um, and then again, we return to the location just after which the function was called um, using JAL. And so that would change that example that we saw um, moments ago. Instead of a jump to printf, we should use the jump and link to printf. Um, and then if we want to run that function again, we want to do a jump and link to printf because that will take us back to the proper value. Um, instead of always returning to a label, we're returning to the instruction just after our jump and link was called. So what holds on to our location is the program counter. Um, so what gets saved is the next address, which is the program counter plus four, since each instruction is four bytes away. Um, we can just add four to our program counter um, and to see what that looks like, I'm going to run this again. And just before I do my jump and link, I want to show you that at this point, our program counter, where this is in yellow, should be at an 8. Let's go to our program counter register, and he's at 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 8. Um, and the instruction after this is this... Um, a C, you know, the value of C. I'm just looking at the last area here, the last two nibbles. And so where we want to, what we want to set JR2 is four bytes after this eight. So when I do my single instruction, my jump and link, he should load up RA with his current line, which is an 8 plus 4 more, which is the 12. So let's go back and look at our A, and of course, he's loaded up with that C, which is a 12. So that's what this is saying. Um, what Jump and Link does is that it saves the program counter plus 4, right, the next instruction inside of our A, um, and then it jumps to the function that you're calling, the callee, and then JR will jump back to whatever that saved value was inside of RA. Um, so we'll look at this next, a leaf function. Um, let's get that set up. So what we've seen is it's fairly easy to create a function. Essentially, creating a function in assembly means creating a label and being able to jump to that label and also being able to receive the arguments, at least knowing where they're going to be, and then being able to return a value, or at least knowing where to place it and returning from that. So if this function that we're calling does not go elsewhere, if it does not call another function, if it ends at that point, if it doesn't branch off, if it's a leaf function, it just ends. If it branches to other functions, um, then, then it's, a, it's, a, it's a branching function. So leaf functions are the, a little bit easier to conceptualize and quite often for uh, the projects that we're going to see and the work that we're going to see here, leaf functions um, are going to be adequate. So if you want to implement this particular leaf function, notice that a0, a1, a2, and a3 will have to be populated with values. Um, since we have one, two, three, four different arguments. And so once you have um, populated a0 through a3 with values, you can create a label called leaf example. Um, and this code here, this is serving as your function. Leaf example will add a0 and a1 
right? And that will serve as g plus h. And then it will add a2 and a3, and that will serve as i plus j, and store that result. And then it will do the subtraction between those two sums, so t0 minus t1. And since we're returning f, um, v0 is the value that gets returned. And so if I return, it really means we're populating v0 with the value that we wish um, the calling function to look at. Uh, and then we can take it uh, by convention that RA will contain the proper address um, to which we must return. It'll be just after the JAL was called. So that's a leaf function. Um, but what if we want to do a little bit more than that? What if we want to jump to another function? Um, then that creates some unique challenges. And so um, it's just as common that we would want to preserve registers during a function call. Um, and so if I were to have a function that calls another function, and by call I mean I use a JAL, what gets um, what gets destroyed is my RA register. And so I would have to save it. So how would you save a register's value, right? I need to reuse RA. How do you save it? Because once you use a JAL and you jump to another function, you want to make sure that when you come back that you can restore RA to its original value. Well, the stack is that area of memory that's used specifically, primarily for functions, to store information. Um, so it's a, an area of memory that's reserved, it's used for functions, and when functions are done, they kind of return that scratch pad back to the operating system. So it's just simply an area for preserving registers and storing function arguments. And the stack um, typically is kind of modeled as starting at the high areas of memory. And every time you do a function call, if you have values that you want to save, you will push things onto a stack, meaning that it will you'll use up memory. And again, think about this like as though it's an upside down array. Um, and then when you're done, uh, you can restore the stack to its previous state. So I'll do an example shortly um, where you can see how the stack is used to preserve um, register values. But it's, it's changing. It's always changing, um, but it's 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 a temporary brief, um, temporary and brief area of memory that's used, and typically for the life of a function. If you have a recursive function, a function that calls another function, who calls another function, who calls another, who calls another, sometimes you can get a stack overflow. Um, and so, but that's we'll, we'll we can talk about how under what conditions that happens. Um, so this is the conventional model, memory model, where you have a stack that's growing downward, and because it's temporary, it's often shared with what we call dynamic data. So if you wanted to allocate memory on a temporary basis, you would use malloc. And malloc uses this dynamic area of memory. So we have the stack for functions, and we have this dynamic data that's stored in this area called a heap. And so heaps um, are that they're that place in memory where, um, for example, if you're using an object-oriented programming language and you create a new object using the new keyword. Um, then that in that that, uh, that object is stored on the heap. And every time you create a new object, it's stored on the heap. And then when you stop using that object, it gets released back to memory. Um, the garbage collector goes ahead and frees up that memory that would have been allocated and placed on the heap. 
um, in C. It's not object oriented programming that we do here. We use malloc versus new, but they serve the same function. Malloc requests resources from memory and requests those resources from the heap. Um, and so those, both the heap and the stack, are these dynamic or temporary um, memory areas. And by convention with MIPS, you'll see that the address um, for heaps starts over in this range, and the addressing for stacks starts here and it grows downward. So by placing these two areas of memory on opposite kind of sides of this, this storage space, um, we uh, optimize this, you know, the, the space, but we really want to minimize the potential for collision. But you can get stack overflows or you can get heap um, overflows where we go beyond our designated area. Um, so usually with operating systems, there is a fixed or allocated, um, the operating system keeps track of how much memory has been given for heap usage. Um, and same for the stack. So if we do run out of heap memory, for example, with Java, you can ask for more when you start your virtual machine. So a stack is a, it's an idea as much as it is an actual, um, thing. All right, so some of you um, certainly have seen plates when you go into a cafeteria and you stack plates one on top of the other. When, you, when it's time to get a plate, you remove from the top. So a stack is the last one on is the first one off. Last in, first out. It's a light bulb. Um, that's different from a queue where people line up and they get in line. The first one in is the first one out. It's a FIFO, F-I-F-O. A stack is the last one in is the first one out. So in um, working with functions, um, we use a stack as a place of storage for placing information that we wish to retrieve um, at a later time. So it keeps them in a particular order. Um, so the stack that you see here, the order in which they, these items were pushed, they went in with a 3, a negative 1, a 2, and an 8. And it would show like this, the 3, the negative 1, the 2, and then an 8. So those are the pushes. And whenever you do a pop, it just retrieves the last item um, that was pushed onto the stack. And if you've taken a data structures and algorithms course, this is that same stack. It's the same idea. Um, it's just a way of having, um, organizing your, your function, organizing your methods. So that when you push something in, it goes into a certain place, but when you pop something, you will always return the value that was most recently pushed. So intuitively, a stack goes, a stack goes from kind of top from bottom to top. The stack that I'm showing you here, it is a stack, but because we want our um, area, this memory area that's used, um, to be kind of dispersed where we have a heap and then we also have a stack, we want those areas to be spread out. Um, we want them on opposite ends of this memory going from um, the lower end up to the upper end. We're going to start pushing things from the top down. So really, this is going to be an upside down version of a stack that we use um, for our application here. So it's still a stack, but when we push, um, every time we push an item, it will go from an address, and then, oops, and then from every time we do a push, Let's go back. It will get us, it will um, decrement the location in memory, right? It will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So every time you push, you're actually going to move into lower areas of memory. So it's an upside down stack. And what's going to help us keep track of where we are 
in memory is a so-called stack pointer. So it is a pointer, uh, at least in usage, but it's really nothing more than a register that contains an address in memory. It's called the stack pointer, um, register SP. And when you want to push something, we're going to have to decrement the stack pointer. So you want to use the value, the address that's there in the stack pointer, put something into memory, decrement it so that we can move to the next area of memory. Um, when we look at MIPS, uh, it's, there are register values. Right? We've seen in MIPS that MIPS has zero register 0 through 31. And we've seen register 0, we've seen V0, A0s, and Ts, and um, primarily A0 through A3, temporary registers. Not so much have we seen the Ss, but these registers down here, we're just starting to learn about. So we know about RA, the return address register. But we also have um, registers that work within um, this temporary memory, this stack memory. So a frame pointer, a stack pointer, and then a global pointer. For right now, let's just talk about the stack pointer. Um, notice that this address in here is 7FFF. That's the high area of memory. And we could use this to actually reference or see what's there in stack. So if we, we can use Mars to go in and take a look at that area. Let's talk about how we can use this stack, uh, this idea of a stack to save information. So let's save a function, right? And we need to implement this in MIPS. Um, for right now, um, let's say that we need to save, oh, three registers. Um, and those registers are T1, T0, and S0. So why would we want to save three registers or, there's, or their values? Um, there was an earlier example that we looked at where we did um, this type of addition. So let's see if I can bring that back up. And so let's say that for this example, where we did uh, implemented this function, we used T0, T1, um, and, um, and when we used these registers, the calling function, the function that brought us here, may have um, also had information in those registers. And so when we jump back, we've destroyed, right? We've destroyed or overwritten information that's in T0 and T1. So what we'd like to do is push that information that's inside of T0 and T1 into the stack, go ahead and use it for our intermediate calculations, and then go ahead and restore those values into T0 and T1 so that when we complete this function and return to the calling function T0 and T1 seem to have never been used, right? Because it's been they've been returned to their original values. So that's our goal here. T0, T1, how can we protect those values so that we can use them here, but then when we return, they get restored back to their original values. So that's what we're doing here. Um, so this model here, remember that stack goes from high memory and then it gets lower as we go downward. Um, so originally the stack pointer um, was directed at a very specific location. So instead of using hex values, I'm going to use numbers that are easy to work with, 52, 48, 44. And we're going to, since we want to put things in to these locations and pull them out, we're going to work with word boundaries, meaning multiples of four. 
So the stack pointer was initially pointing at 48. I realized that I want to um, use t1, t0, and s0 in my function. So what I'm going to do is um, go ahead and push one, two, three values onto my stack. Again, we can. if I could flip this upside down, I could. It's an upside down stack. So how can I push these values and put them into memory at these locations, right? I'm going to have to do this three different times. So what I could do is decrement SP. So add to SP um, minus four and then do a load word. And then add I is what I'm doing to SP, another negative four and then do another uh, did I say load? Uh, not load word, but store word. We're putting these values into memory. So store word and then decrement sp by adding a negative 4, another store word, um, and then decrement sp and then another store word. And then once we're done with our function, we can um, do a load word and pull those values, that information, back into registers. Um, so let's see what that would look like. Um, there are a couple of ways of pushing information into a stack. Um, some languages have a simple push, push, where you do a push RA, um, right? And that's the, if we look at the stack as though it's right side up, RA gets pushed in, and then do a push S0, S0 gets pushed in. So, but we're working with memory in this kind of upside down fashion. So RA gets push and then S0. So how do we work with that? How do we do that? Well, again, since we're working um, with an upside down stack, what we're going to do is um, take the current value of SP, decrement it by four. So SP starts at one location, decrement it by four and then store um, RA into that address. Store that value of RA into memory that's designated by the stack pointer. And so what this represents is the value that's inside of RA that gets pushed into memory. So we've decremented it by four, we store a value. Then we need to decrement it by four again and store the second value. So that's how we would do a push of RA and then a push of S0. Each push is going to require two operations. First, decrement to find an empty spot and then store the value into that place in memory. Decrement and then store that value into memory. So that's a push. Um, those two lines make up a push and then these two lines make up a push. And the decrement by four is because we're using this memory model where we're um, going downward in the stack. So a more efficient way of doing this, realizing um, that we need to put two values in, I could have just simply added eight to my stack pointer and then stored and stored into those spots. And that's what this bit of code does. It moves the stack pointer down to and then it stores SP into an offset of four, and then SP into an offset of, um, so it's S, and then S0 into an offset of zero. So it stores RA into an offset of four, and then it stores S0 um, into an offset of zero. Um, so, I'll try to sketch this out a little bit better with um, with the one note. It's kind of a challenge to do this when I am at the workstation. I can't kind of show the imagery here. Um, so you'll, you'll I'll, I'll step through this um, a little bit later with uh, with my I guess my electronic whiteboard essentially. So that's what's going on. These two instructions here are the same as these two instructions here. Requires fewer lines to do it because instead of having to do an add i and add i 
twice, right? We can just use one of the instructions, which does an addition for us. Um, so we can reduce our instruction count. Um, so that's a brief um, kind of description of, 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 uh, of how this stack works. Um, so, so in this leaf example, um, our implementation looks the same as it did before. A0 and A1 are being added, A2 and A3 are being added, and then T0 and T1 are subtracted. Um, so our basic function hasn't changed. What's important here is that we decided to use intermediate, or to get these intermediate values. Um, T0 and T1 are both the sums, and, T, and this one, S0, was the difference. But we don't know that we have total um, freedom to use those. So if, there are, if our function were to return, we may have actually destroyed values in T0, T1, and S0. So once you've done this internal part, what you'd like to do um, is then recognize that these three registers need to be saved. Since each register occupies four bytes, three times four is 12. So if I decrement my stack pointer by 12 and then store the values of these registers into those three locations, um, then those registers are saved. Well, then I can go ahead and use them. And then once I've set up my return value and I'm ready to go back to the calling function, what I need to do is restore each one of those values and put them back into S0, T0, and T1, restore the stack pointer, and then return. So that's how we use a stack. It's a temporary storage um, location. Um, and um, typically, for me, it, it certainly um, is easier to start with the function. Um, and then knowing which registers you want to save, you can go back and do what we call the um, the prologue and the epilogue, the two parts that happen before the story and after the story. Um, and then these, these two components mirror one another. Um, the T1, T0, S0, the T1, T0, S0, and the 0, 4, and 8, and 0, 4, and 8. So there are some patterns here that, that help us um, kind of step through this. And, and put this epilogue and prologue together. Um, so, uh, and more uh, examples are going to be needed, but I'll, I'll stop right here and, and look for other examples to follow.